Thank you. It's good to see you all again this morning. Today I'm going to go into more depth in discussing one of the reasons that I offered last night for belief in God, namely the moral argument for God's existence. We want to explore in more detail how God can provide an objective foundation for moral values and duties. Before I do, though, I want to underline what Jim has said. I understand that for many of you last night was sort of like drinking out of a fire hose. And it went by so quickly it might have been difficult to take notes on or to absorb. And yet it is my real and genuine desire that this material not just be inspiring or encouraging, but something you can actually use in sharing your faith with an unbeliever. So I, I want to say that the, many of the arguments that were talked about last night are described in On Guard. This includes chapters on the contingency argument, the cosmological argument for the origin of the universe, the fine-tuning argument, and the moral argument for God's existence, including a statement of the premises, in case those went by too quickly, and then a defense of each premise, and then answers to the main objections to those premises. Reasonable faith goes into even more detail. On guard is for the beginner. It's a primer. Uh, reasonable faith is a more intermediate level book, and so it includes the ontological argument as well that we talked about last night. So if you want to get those arguments on paper so that you can study them at leisure, look at the defenses for the premises as well as the answers to the principal objections, I would really commend to you uh, both on guard and reasonable faith. Now today, we want to look more in depth at the moral argument. And to do so, I want to use as our springboard the question, can we be good without God? Now, at first, even to pose this question is apt to arouse indignation. For while those of us who are theists undoubtedly find in God a source of moral strength that enables us to live better lives than we would have lived without him, nevertheless, it would seem arrogant and ignorant to claim that people who do not believe in God don't also live good moral lives, indeed embarrassingly, sometimes lives that put our own to shame. But wait, it would indeed be arrogant and ignorant to claim that people cannot be good without belief in God. But that wasn't the question. The question was, can we be good without God? And when we pose that question, we are asking, in a provocative way, the meta-ethical question about the objectivity of moral values and duties. Are the moral values that we guide our lives by uh, mere social conventions, akin to driving on the right hand versus the left hand side of the road? Or are they mere expressions of personal taste, like having a preference for chocolate rather than vanilla? Or are these values somehow valid independently of our apprehension of them? And if so, what is their foundation? As the humanist philosopher Paul Kurtz writes, the central question about moral and ethical principles concerns their ontological foundation that is to say their foundation in reality. If they are neither derived from God nor anchored in some transcendent realm, are they purely ephemeral? In his book, The Courage to Become, Kurtz helpfully distinguishes three main views in answer to this question. Theism maintains that moral values are grounded in God. Humanism maintains that moral values are grounded in human beings. And nihilism 
maintains that moral values have no ground at all and are therefore ultimately illusory and non-binding. Now, how we answer the question before us this morning obviously depends on what we mean by morality. If by morality you mean simply a certain pattern of social behavior exhibited by human beings, then obviously that sort of behavior could go on even if it turned out that God does not exist. God isn't necessary in order for people to exhibit a certain pattern of social behavior. But if by morality you mean that certain things are really good or evil, that certain actions are unconditionally obligatory or prohibited for us, then many theists and non-theists alike agree that God is indeed necessary for morality. In the absence of God, human morality turns out to be just an illusion. The same patterns of social behavior might go on in the absence of God, but it would be a delusion to think that such behavior has any objective moral significance. Accordingly, I'm going to argue this morning that if God exists, then the objectivity of moral values and duties is secured. But that in the absence of God, that is to say, if God does not exist, then morality is just a human convention. That is to say, morality is completely subjective and non-binding. We might act in precisely the same ways that we do in fact act, but in the absence of God, such actions would no longer count as good or evil, right or wrong, since if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. And thus, we cannot truly be good without God. On the other hand, if we believe that moral values and duties are objective, then I think that provides moral grounds for believing in God. Moreover, I want to raise the question this morning, if morality is just a human illusion, then why should we act morally, especially when it conflicts with self-interest? Or are we instead held accountable in some way for our moral decisions and actions? I'll argue that theism provides a more a coherent account of morality by providing a basis for moral accountability. Consider then the hypothesis that God exists, whereby God, I mean a supreme personal being. First, if God exists, then objective moral values exist. When we talk about moral values, we're talking about whether something is good or evil. To say that there are objective moral values is to say that something is good or evil, right or wrong, independently of whether anybody believes it to be so. It's to say, for example, that Nazi anti-Semitism was objectively wrong even though the Nazis who carried out the Holocaust thought that it was right. And it would still be wrong even if the Nazis had won World War II and succeeded in brainwashing or exterminating everybody who disagreed with them so that everybody thought the Holocaust was good. On the theistic view, Objective moral values are grounded in God. God's own holy and perfectly good nature supplies the objective standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. God's nature is thus what Plato called the good. He is the locus and source of moral value. 
He is by nature loving, generous, kind, fair, faithful, and so on and so forth. Now, sometimes people will ask, does God will something because it is good? Or is something good because God wills it? This question poses a false dilemma. Traditional theism rejects both of those alternatives. The alternative traditionally taken by theists is that God wills something because he is good. That is to say, the good just is the moral nature of God himself. He is the paradigm of goodness. And therefore, the good is not independent of God, uh, but rather is God himself. So if God exists, objective moral values exist. Second, if God exists, objective moral duties exist. Duties have to do with whether something is right or wrong. Now, you might think at first that the distinction between right and wrong is the same as the distinction between good and evil. But if you think about it for a minute, I think you can see that that isn't the case. Duty has to do with moral obligation, what I ought or ought not to do. Now, obviously, you are not morally obligated to do something simply because it would be good for you to do it. For example, it would be good for you to become a doctor. But you're not morally obligated to become a doctor. After all, it would also be good for you to become a fighter fighter or a homemaker or uh, a diplomat, and you can't do them all. So just because something is good for you to do doesn't mean that you have a moral duty to do it. There is a difference between moral values and moral duties or obligations and prohibitions. So to say that we have objective moral duties is, again, to say that we have certain moral obligations to fulfill even if we aren't aware of it and think that we do. We have certain duties to perform which are independently binding of whether or not we think that we have them. On theism, our moral duties are constituted by God's commands. God's moral nature is expressed in relation to us in the form of certain commands which constitute our moral duties or obligations. Far from being arbitrary, these commands are reflections of God's own moral nature. They are an expression of his character. And therefore, God's commands to us are not capricious, but rather they are reflections of his character. And therefore, it makes no sense to ask, for example, if God were to command us to eat our children, would we be morally obligated to eat our children. This proposition has an impossible antecedent and therefore no non-trivial truth value. It's like asking, if there were a square circle, would its area be equal to the square of one of its sides? There's simply no answer to a question like that because it's logically incoherent. Our duties then are constituted by God's commandments, and these in turn are reflections of his moral character. In the Judeo-Christian faith, our whole moral duty can be summed up in the two great commandments. First, you shall love the Lord your God with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your heart, and with all your mind. And secondly, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On this foundation, we can affirm the objective rightness of love, generosity, self-sacrifice, and equality, and condemn as objectively wrong selfishness, hatred, abuse, discrimination, and oppression. 
Finally, on the theistic hypothesis, God holds all persons morally accountable for their actions. Evil and wrong will be punished. Righteousness will be vindicated. Good ultimately triumphs over evil, and we shall finally see that we do live in a moral world after all. Despite the inequities of this earthly life, in the end, the scales of God's justice will be balanced. And thus, the moral decisions that we make in this life are infused with an eternal significance. We can, with consistency, make moral choices which run contrary to our self-interest and even undertake acts of extreme self-sacrifice, knowing that such decisions are not ultimately empty and meaningless gestures. Rather, our moral lives have a paramount significance. So I think it's evident that theism provides a sound foundation for morality. Now contrast this with the non-theistic hypothesis. First, if God does not exist, then what is the foundation for objective moral values? More particularly, what is the basis for the objective value of human beings? If God does not exist, then it's difficult to see any reason to think that human beings are special or that their morality is objectively true. On the atheistic view, human beings are just accidental byproducts of nature which have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust called the planet Earth, lost somewhere in a hostile and mindless universe in which are doomed to perish uh, collectively and individually in a relatively short time. On a naturalistic view, moral values are just the byproducts of biological evolution and social conditioning. Just as a troop of baboons exhibits cooperative and even altruistic behavior because natural selection has determined it to be advantageous in the struggle for survival, so their primate cousins, Homo sapiens, have developed a herd morality for the same reason. As a result of socio-biological pressures, there has evolved among Homo sapiens a sort of herd morality which functions very well in the perpetuation of our species. But on the atheistic view, there doesn't seem to be anything about Homo sapiens that would make this morality objectively true. The philosopher of science Michael Roos reports, the position of the modern evolutionist is that humans have an awareness of morality because such an awareness is of biological worth. Morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction and any deeper meaning is illusory. If we were to rewind the film of human evolution back to the beginning and start anew, people with a very different set of moral values might well have evolved. As Darwin himself wrote in The Descent of Man, if men were raised under precisely the same conditions as hive bees, there can hardly be a doubt that our unmarried females would, like the worker bees, think it a sacred duty to kill their brothers 
and mothers would strive to kill their fertile daughters, and no one would think of interfering. For us to think that human beings are special and our morality objectively true is to succumb to the temptation of speciesism, that is to say, an unjustified bias toward one's own species. The objective worthlessness of human beings on a naturalistic worldview is underscored by two implications of that view, materialism and determinism. Naturalists are typically materialists or atheists who regard man as a purely animal organism. But if man has no immaterial aspect to his uh, person, call it a mind or a soul or what have you, then everything we think and do is determined by the genetic makeup of our bodies and the input of our five senses. There is no personal agent who freely decides to do something. But without freedom, none of our choices is morally significant. They're just like the jerks of a puppet's limbs, controlled by the strings of sensory input and physical constitution. And what moral significance does a puppet or its motions have? Richard Dawkins' assessment of human worth may be depressing, but why on atheism is he mistaken when he says, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA. It is every living object's sole reason for being. If there is no God, then any reason for regarding the herd morality evolved by Homo sapiens on this planet as objectively true seems to have been removed. Take God out of the picture, and all you seem to be left with is an ape-like creature on a speck of solar dust endowed with delusions of moral grandeur. Second. If God does not exist, objective moral duties do not exist. If God does not exist, then what source remains for objective moral duties? Traditionally, our moral duties were thought to spring from God's commandments, such as the Ten Commandments. But if there is no God, then what basis remains for objective moral duties? On the atheistic view, human beings are just animals, relatively advanced primates, and animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a lion kills a zebra, it kills the zebra, but it doesn't murder the zebra. When a great white shark forcibly copulates with a female, it forcibly copulates with her, but it doesn't rape her. Because on naturalism, none of these actions have any moral significance. They are neither prohibited nor obligatory. So if God does not exist, why think that we have any moral obligations to do anything? Who or what imposes these moral obligations upon us? Where do they come from? It's hard to see why they would be anything more than a subjective impression ingrained into us by societal and parental conditioning. On the atheistic view, there is no divine lawgiver. But then what source is there for moral obligation? Richard Taylor, who is an eminent ethicist, writes, the modern age, more or less repudiating the idea of a divine lawgiver, has nevertheless tried to retain the ideas of moral right and wrong, not noticing that in casting God aside, they have also abolished the conditions of meaningfulness for moral right and wrong as well. Thus, 
even educated persons sometimes declare that such things as war or abortion or the violation of certain human rights are morally wrong. And they imagine that they have said something true and significant. Educated people do not need to be told, however, that questions such as these have never been answered outside of religion. He concludes, contemporary writers in ethics who blithely discourse upon moral right and wrong and moral obligation without any reference to religion are really just weaving intellectual webs from thin air, which amounts to saying that they discourse without meaning. On the atheistic view, certain actions like incest and rape may not be biologically and socially advantageous and so in the course of human development have become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that these actions are really wrong. Such behavior goes on all the time in the animal kingdom. If, as Kurtz states, the moral principles that govern our behavior are rooted in habit and custom, feeling and fashion, then the man who belches loudly at the dinner table is doing nothing more serious than the person who goes against the herd morality, just acting unfashionably. Uh, if there is no moral lawgiver, then there is no objective moral law which we are obligated to obey. Now, it's very important that we understand the issue before us. The question is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? No, there's no reason to think that non-theists and theists alike may not live what we normally characterize as good and decent lives. Similarly, the question is not, can we formulate a system of ethics without reference to God? If the non-theist grants that human beings do have intrinsic moral value, then there's no reason to think he cannot work out a system of ethics with which the theist would largely agree. Or again, the question is not, can we recognize the existence of objective moral values and duties without believing in God? The theist will typically maintain that you do not need to believe in God in order to recognize, for example, that you ought to love your children rather than abuse them. Thus, if God does not exist, it becomes impossible to condemn war, oppression, or crime as objectively evil, nor can we praise brotherhood, equality, or love as objectively good. It does not matter what you choose, for there is no right or wrong, good and evil do not exist. Now think of what that means. That means that a tragedy like the Holocaust was really morally indifferent. You may think that it was wrong, but the Nazi perpetrators who carried it out thought that it was good. In his book, Morality After Auschwitz, Peter Haas asks how an entire society could have willingly participated in a state-sponsored program of mass torture and genocide for over a decade without raising any serious opposition. He argues that, and I quote, far from being contemptuous of ethics, the perpetrators acted in strict conformity with an ethic which held that however difficult or unpleasant the task might have been, mass extermination of the Jews and gypsies was entirely justified. The Holocaust, as a sustained effort, was possible only because a new ethic was in place that did not define the arrest and deportation of Jews as wrong, and in fact defined it 
as ethically tolerable and even good. Moreover, Haas points out, because of its coherence and internal consistency, the Nazi ethic could not be discredited from within, only from a transcendent vantage point, which stands above the relativistic, socio-cultural mores could such a critique be launched. But in the absence of God, it is precisely such a transcendent vantage point that we lack. One rabbi who was imprisoned at Auschwitz said that it was as though a world existed in which the Ten Commandments had been reversed. Thou shalt kill, thou shalt lie, thou shalt steal. Mankind has never seen such a hell. And yet, in a real sense, if God does not exist, then our world is Auschwitz. There is no objective right or wrong, no objective good or evil. Objective moral values and duties do not exist. Finally, my third point. If God does not exist, there is no moral accountability for one's actions. Even if there were objective moral values and duties on atheism, they're irrelevant because there is no moral accountability. If life ends at the grave, then it makes no difference whether one has lived as a Stalin or as a Mother Teresa. As the Russian writer Fyodor Dostoevsky rightly said, if there is no immortality, then all things are permitted. The state torturers in the Soviet prisons understood this all too well. Richard Wurmbrandt, a pastor who was tortured for his faith, wrote, the cruelty of atheism is hard to believe when man has no faith in the reward of good or the punishment of evil. There is no reason to be human. There is no restraint from the depths of evil which is in man. The communist torturers often said, there is no God, no hereafter, no punishment for evil. We can do what we wish. I have heard one torturer even say, I thank God in whom I don't believe that I have lived to this hour when I can express all the evil in my heart. He expressed it in unbelievable brutality and torture inflicted on prisoners. Given the finality of death, it really does not matter how you live. So what do you say to someone who concludes that we may as well just live for pure self-interest, just live as we please? This presents a pretty grim picture for an atheistic ethicist like Kai Nielsen at the University of Calgary. He writes, we have not been able to show that reason requires the moral point of view or that all really rational persons should not be individual egoists or classical ah moralists. Reason doesn't decide here. The picture I have painted for you is not a pleasant one. Reflection on it depresses me. Pure, practical reason, even with a good knowledge of the facts, will not take you to morality. Now someone might say, but it's in your best self-interest to adopt a moral lifestyle. But clearly, that is not always true. We all know situations in which self-interest runs smack dab in the face of morality. Moreover, if one is sufficiently powerful, like a Ferdinand Marcos, or a Papa Doc Duvalier, or even a Donald Trump, then one can pretty much ignore the dictates of consciousness and live safely in self-indulgence. Historian Stuart C. Easton sums it up well when he writes, there is no objective reason why man should be moral unless morality pays off in his social life or makes him feel good. There is no objective reason why man should do anything save 
for the pleasure it affords him. Acts of self-sacrifice become particularly inept on an atheistic worldview. Why should you sacrifice your self-interest and especially your life for the sake of someone else? There can be good, no good reason for adopting such a self-negating course of action on the atheistic worldview. Considered from the sociobiological point of view, such altruistic behavior is merely the result of evolutionary conditioning, which helps to perpetuate the species. A mother rushing into a burning building to save her child, or a soldier who sacrifices his life for the sake of his comrades, does nothing more significant or praiseworthy, morally speaking, than a fighter ant, which sacrifices itself for the sake of the ant heap. Common sense dictates that we, if we can, we should resist these blind sociobiological pressures to such self-destructive activity and instead choose to act in our own best self-interest. The philosopher of religion John Hick imagines an ant suddenly endowed with the insights of sociobiology and the freedom to make personal decisions. He writes, suppose him to be called upon to immolate himself for the sake of the anthill. He feels the powerful pressure of instinct pushing him toward this self-destruction. But he asks himself, why should he voluntarily carry out the suicidal program to which instinct prompts him? Why should he regard the future existence of a million, million other ants as more important to him than his own continued existence, since all that he is and has and ever can have is his own present existence, surely insofar as he is free from the domination of the blind force of instinct, he will opt for life, his own life. Now why should we choose any differently? on atheism. The absence of moral accountability from the philosophy of naturalism makes an ethic of compassion and self-sacrifice a hollow abstraction. R.Z. Friedman, who is a philosopher at the University of Toronto, concludes, and I quote, without religion, the coherence of an ethic of compassion cannot be established the principle of respect for persons and the principle of the survival of the fittest are mutually exclusive. We thus come to radically different perspectives on morality, depending upon whether or not God exists. If God exists, then we have a sound foundation for morality. If God does not exist, then there are no objective moral values, no objective moral duties, and no moral accountability. We are ultimately landed in nihilism. Therefore, it seems to me, God is vitally important to morality. Now, as I said, this is actually a conclusion which is accepted by a good number of atheist philosophers, such as Nietzsche, Russell, and Sartre. Though the conclusion is a painful one, these atheist thinkers believe that honesty compels them to accept it um, squarely. The challenge confronting the non-theist philosopher who continues to cling to objective moral values and duties after letting go of God is threefold. First, he has to explain what is the basis for objective moral values on atheism. In particular, what is the basis for the intrinsic value of human beings? Secondly, he needs to explain what is the source of objective moral duties on atheism. What makes certain acts obligatory or forbidden for us if there is no one to command or prohibit them? And thirdly, he needs to explain how on atheism ultimate moral accountability exists, or else to explain why 
it isn't necessary to morality. But the choice between theism and non-theism need not be arbitrarily made. On the contrary, the very considerations that we've been talking about this morning can constitute moral grounds for belief in God. For example, if we think that objective moral values do exist, then we shall be led logically to the conclusion that God exists. And could anything be more obviously true than the fact that objective moral values do exist? There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. The reasoning of Michael Roos, quoted earlier, is at worst a textbook example of the genetic fallacy, uh, which tries to invalidate a point of view by showing how you came to believe in it, and at best only proves that our subjective perception of objective moral values and duties has gradually evolved. But if moral values are gradually discovered rather than gradually invented, then our fallible and gradual apprehension of the moral realm no more undermines the objective reality of that realm than our gradual, fallible apprehension of the physical world undermines the objectivity of the physical realm. The fact is that we do apprehend objective values, and we all know it. Actions like rape, torture, child abuse, and brutality aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. As Roos himself states, the man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Notice that here, Roos ascribes to moral truths the same logical necessity and certainty that is possessed by mathematical truths, like two plus two equals four. By the same token, love, generosity, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. And people who fail to see this are just morally handicapped. Uh, they're like a blind person. And there's no reason to allow their impaired vision to call, make us call into question what we do see clearly. Thus, the existence of objective moral values serves to demonstrate the existence of God. Or consider the nature of moral obligation. In moral experience, we find certain moral obligations or prohibitions imposed upon us. Speaking recently on a major Canadian university campus, I noticed a poster in the hall placed by the Sexual Assault and Information Center at the university, and it read, Sexual Assault. No one has the right to abuse a child, woman, or man. Now, I think most of us recognize that statement is evidently true, but the atheist can make no sense of a person's right not to be sexually abused by another. The best answer to the question as to the source of moral obligation is that moral rightness or wrongness consists in agreement or disagreement with the will or commands of a holy, loving God. But then it follows that if you do believe that certain acts are really right or wrong, you should believe in God. Finally, Take the problem of moral accountability. Here we find a powerful practical argument for believing in God. According to the philosopher William James, practical arguments can be used when theoretical arguments are insufficient to decide a question of urgent and pragmatic importance. But it seems to me obvious that a practical argument could also be used to back up or motivate the acceptance of the conclusion of a sound theoretical argument. 
To believe then that God does not exist and that there is thus no moral accountability would be quite literally demoralizing. For we then have to accept that our moral choices are ultimately insignificant, since both our fate and that of the universe will be the same regardless of what we do. By demoralization, I mean a deterioration of moral motivation. It's hard to do the right thing when uh, it goes contrary to your self-interest or when temptation to do wrong is strong. And the belief that ultimately it does not matter what you choose uh, is apt to sap one's moral resolve and so undermine one's moral life. As Robert Adams observed, having to regard it as very likely that the history of the universe will not be good on the whole, no matter what one does, seems apt to induce a cynical sense of futility about the moral life, undermining one's moral resolve and one's interest in moral considerations. By contrast, there is nothing so likely to strengthen the moral life as the beliefs that one will be held accountable for one's actions and that one's choices do make a difference in bringing about the good. Theism is thus a morally advantageous belief to hold, and this in the absence of any theoretical argument establishing atheism to be the case provides practical grounds for believing in God and motivation to accept the conclusion of the two theoretical arguments that I just gave. In summary then, theological, meta-ethical foundations do seem to be necessary for morality. If God does not exist, then it is plausible to think that there are no objective moral values, no objective moral duties, and that there is no moral accountability for how we live and act. The horror of such a morally neutral universe is obvious. If, on the other hand, we believe, as it seems rational to do, that objective moral values and duties do exist, then we have good grounds for believing in the existence of God. In addition, we have powerful, practical reasons for embracing theism in view of the morally bracing effects which such a belief in moral accountability produces. In conclusion, then, we cannot truly be good without God. But if we can, in some measure, be good, then it follows logically that God exists. All right, we have a few minutes remaining for questions. There's a question over here if somebody has a roving mic. Hi, uh, I had a problem with the, um, the first point in your second uh, part there uh, that you were arguing that, uh, without obje or that if God does not exist, then objective morality does not exist. And uh, while I do agree with that statement, and uh, I did wonder how you, I, I guess I wanted a clarification as to how you got to that point, because it seemed as though you kind of made an oblique reference to the idea that without, in a purely physical world, you don't have free will, and therefore moral activity is meaningless, ultimately, just like a puppet. Um, but other than that, you could make the point that that's sort of an argument from incredulity based on the fact that just because you cannot establish a basis apart because from you God, cannot establish what because you can't establish a basis for objective morals apart from the existence of God that that would mean that they don't exist but I mean a lot of atheists would say that like mathematical truths do exist abstractly despite the fact that uh, mm. they don't necessarily that they don't have that basis all right there's a number of things that could be said here it seems to me that the need for explanation in moral theory is very important. You can't just take a shopping list approach to the moral principles and values that you want to hold dear. There needs to be some sort of explanation for why 
we would have the moral duties and prohibitions that we do. Theism gives a very clear explanation of that, I think you'd agree. But on atheism, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to see why there would be any sort of moral obligation or prohibition on this particular animal species on this planet. So that atheism is an explanatorily deficient worldview, it seems to me. The, the idea that I ought not to do something just seems to come out of magic, out of nowhere on the, the atheistic worldview. So it's, it seems clear to me that theism is explanatorily superior to atheism in this regard. I would not say that you can simply posit the reality of mathematical, of uh, moral principles or um, values in a sort of Platonistic way because First of all, I, I can't even understand what that means to say, for example, that the good exists. I can understand what it means to say a person is good or an action is good, but to say that goodness just exists as an abstraction, I can't even make sense of that. Secondly, there doesn't seem to be any source of moral obligation in this sort of Platonistic view. Uh, why am I obliged to align my life with one set of abstractions rather than another set of abstractions. Presumably on this view, vice and greed and hatred and rapacity also exist. Why am I obligated to align my life with one rather than the other? And finally, a third point would be that it is enormously improbable on atheism that the blind evolutionary process would produce a creature who comes to believe in precisely those independently existing moral values and duties that are in this causally isolated abstract realm. That is an utterly, utterly improbable coincidence. Theism is far more plausible in that it regards the evolutionary process and the moral realm as both under the sovereign direction of a moral lawgiver and creator of the physical universe. So there is a coherence to the theistic worldview that I think is sorely lacking in atheism. Thank you. Whoever has the mic, go ahead and give it to someone holding his hand up. Yes. Hello. Uh, so, something I wanted to add is um, I really like that point you just made. In the academic realm, I think a lot of naturalists are willing to accept the implications of atheism, of naturalism, that there aren't objectively right or wrong things. But on the popular level, I think a lot of people feel like there is right and wrong, and we should generally follow our consciences. But like you pointed out, if our consciences are the result of naturalistic evolution, we'd have no reason for trusting that they would tell us anything other than to how to pass on our genes. So I think pointing out that inconsistency is a whole lot easier than um, going into a lot of these in-depth arguments with someone that just has a passing interest in this topic. I would agree with part of what you said, though I think you would be surprised the degree to which university professors are moral realists. The majority of philosophy professors and university faculty, surveys have actually shown this, uh, are believe in the objectivity of moral values and duties they are far less relativistic than their students. This is a misconception uh, that, that the faculty are the relativists and nihilists uh, more so than the students. Quite the contrary. The, the faculty, I think, have thought through the consequences of a moral nihilistic universe and have been repulsed by them, um, whereas the students give a kind of superficial blithe lip service to relativism, not really understanding the horrible consequences of that. So actually, the, the view that objective moral values and duties exist would be one that would be very widely agreed to by faculty, including philosophy faculty. Some other question? The, the last question? Okay. Right here. Where are we? All the way in the back. Right here. Okay, over here, yes. My question to you this morning is, sir, can you explain the mind of an atheist? 
And also, uh, do they have a depraved mind? Or okay, I'm having a little difficulty understanding you. Can you uh, okay. articulate the question again? My question is that can you explain the mind of an atheist? Explain the what of atheists? The mind. The mind yes. of atheists. And if you do, do they have a depraved mind? A, what, a depraved mind. Depraved mind uh -huh. or reprobate mind. Well, now, speaking theologically, what Paul says in Romans chapter 1 is that the existence of God is evident to every person from the creation around us, but that people suppress the truth and unrighteousness, and as a result, their minds are darkened. Um, so I do think that the intellect of the natural man, uh, as Paul calls him, apart from God, is darkened by sin and therefore resists God and fails to um, believe what, in fact, he really knows is true, namely that, that God does exist. So. In sharing arguments like this with an unbeliever, we need to always be trusting in the Holy Spirit to open the hardened heart of the unbeliever and to enlighten his darkened intellect so that he can see the, the force of the arguments and accept their conclusions. I have found in dealing with atheists that sometimes their minds are so hardened that they will affirm the most absurd things in order to avoid the conclusions to which the argument is driving them. For example, to assert that the universe just popped into existence uncaused out of absolutely nothing. They, they will affirm that rather than agree to the conclusion of the argument to which it's leading. And in a case like that, the role of the Christian apologist, I think, is simply to help the atheist see what sort of intellectual price he's going to have to pay to maintain his atheism. And our goal is to raise that price tag as high as possible so that hopefully the atheist will say, this is too much of a price to pay in order to remain an atheist. I will come to believe in God. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, such a person can be led to come to God and, and to Christ. Thank you.